I now give the floor to His Excellency Ibrahim bin Abdulaziz Al Assaf, Minister for Foreign Minister for Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Your Excellency, President of the General Assembly, Your Excellency, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you. At the outset, I have the pleasure to convey to you Professor Tijani Muhammad Bandi, my sincerest congratulations on his election for the 74th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And I would like to thank His Excellency, Her Excellency, rather, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces, for her efforts as president of the former session of the General Assembly. In addition, I would like to pay special tribute to His Excellency, the General, the General Secretary, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I had hoped to talk today about the efforts made by my country, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, a founding member of the United Nations, to fulfill the purposes of the United Nations Charter in preserving peace and security for the peoples around the world, its role in achieving prosperity, growth and stability in our region, as well as its development and humanitarian efforts worldwide. I would have liked also to outline the economic and social challenges facing our world, such as poverty, the spread of diseases, climate change, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, among others. While highlighting the Kingdom's position and perspective on these issues, I wanted to talk about the country's ongoing economic development and reforms in various fields. The vision that takes us back to our true Islamic faith that rejects all forms of extremism. A vision that aims at achieving an advanced and innovative society in all areas, a connected society that is engaged with its surroundings and the world. However, the aggressive act of September 14th on the Kingdom's oil facilities, violated the principles of this organization as enshrined in its charter and threatened the security, stability and prosperity of our region and the world. This aggression requires from all of us a historic position, which I will lay out in my address today. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the reprehensible attacks on the Kingdom's oil facilities by 25 cruise missiles and drones which cut oil production by almost half, that is equivalent to 5.7 million barrels, is a flagrant violation of international laws and regulations. Those attacks are violations of international peace and security and constitute a significant threat to global oil supplies. I repeat, those attacks are flagrant violations of international laws and regulations. They are an attack on international peace and security and constitute a significant threat to global oil supplies. We know very well who stood behind this aggression. We invited UN and international experts to pin down the perpetrator. Those who stood behind these attacks are also responsible for the other assaults on commercial tankers in the Gulf of Oman last June and July, and the attacks on Abha Airport in July, Abha Airport in Saudi Arabia, and the Shaiba oil field last August. 
It is a vile and cowardly regime which hides behind its affiliated militias, pushing them to claim responsibility for attacks on Apkaik and Khurais oil installations and before that on an oil pumping facility. That same regime views our states and peoples only as a battlefield to achieve its subversive agenda. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, we've known this regime for 40 years. It is good at nothing but masterminding explosions, destruction and assassinations, not only in our region, but also throughout the world. This is the same regime which ever since its inception carried out terrorist attacks inside the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, Kuwait, Lebanon, as well as European countries and beyond. It is the same regime which assassinated a number of Saudi diplomats in Thailand in 1989 and 1990 and was responsible for the assassination in 2011 of a Saudi diplomat in Karachi. May they all rest in peace. Also, in that same year, the regime tried to assassinate the kingdom's ambassador to the United States. It is that regime which in 2005 slayed the prime minister of Lebanon, Rafiq al-Hariri, in the heart of Beirut. This approach unfortunately continues to this day, as we've witnessed in recent years, when this regime tried to conduct terrorist attacks in France and in Denmark, and not a day goes by without bearing witness to its terrorist methods in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and other countries in the region. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the latest attacks and aggression have exposed the Iranian regime to the entire world. We are dealing with a rogue and terrorist regime that continues to threaten international peace and security. It is also jeopardizing ener energy supplies and the world economy. Hence, the recent attacks are a real test of the international community's will. This organization, as well as the entire world, is faced with a moral and historic responsibility to take a firm and unified position. Utmost pressure should be applied using every tool available to end the terrorist and aggressive behavior of the Iranian regime. It is a position that should not make do with half measures and partial or interim agreements. It should rather seek to change the character and behavior of this rogue regime. Otherwise, the region, international peace and security, as well as the stability of the world economy and energy will face an unknown future. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen how the policy of appeasement in the last century led to death and destruction. And we have seen how the same policy of appeasement towards the Iranian regime through partial agreements has increased its terrorist and aggressive activities over the last four years. This regime can only be confronted with a firm and unified stand and the application of maximum and sustained pressure until it desists from its terrorist behavior. Mr. President, we, all of us, we have to deal with this regime based on its nature and reality and not based on assumptions that have been repeatedly proven to be incorrect. The reality is that this bloodthirsty regime is no longer only menacing the peoples of the region, it is menacing the whole world. It is an illusion to believe that partial accords or lifting sanctions and going back to the past agreement that has proven its failure would put Iran on the path of moderation and would rid the world of its evil. Whoever needs a proof that the nuclear agreement has failed should simply look at the crimes committed by the Iranian regime in Syria, crimes that claimed the lives of more than half a million people. The Iranian regime participated in killing the Syrian people either directly or through its proxies and support for militias like the terrorist Hezbollah. Another evidence is the debris of more than 250 missiles that were launched on our citizens 
inside the kingdom. This organization acknowledged that the Iranian regime provided its militias in Yemen with those missiles in blatant violation of Security Council resolutions 2216 and 2231. For further evidence, one should also look at the party responsible for disrupting a political solution in Yemen, breaching international resolutions, targeting civilians, threatening maritime shipping lanes, and blocking the delivery of humanitarian aid. This rogue regime made use of revenues resulting from the nuclear agreement to finance its aggression and terrorist activities. Therefore, it is necessary for the international community today to realize that cutting off sources of finance is the best way to compel the regime to renounce its militias, to prevent it from developing ballistic missiles, and to put an end to its destabilizing activities in the region and in the world. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, today we bear a historic responsibility. The credibility of this organization and the entire world is at stake. The Iranian regime is left with one of two options, either become a normal state that respects international laws and norms, or face an international unified position that uses all instruments of pressure and deterrence. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, my country, the land of the two holy mosques, the land of the Kaaba, to which Muslims turn to pray, has never promoted war, but it will stop at nothing to defend its holy sites and its sovereignty. Thank you and peace be upon you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank His Excellency Minister for Foreign Affairs of Blotherly Saudi Arabia.